Hi everyone, just to give a brief introduction about myself before we go into the topic. My name is Mamta Ito. I'm the founder of an organization called Rights of Nature Europe, which is about establishing rights of nature in law. Um, my career background is in law. I'm a lawyer with both corporate and grassroots experience. And so everything that I talk about in this talk really comes from deep experience of how the system works. So, who here feels that we are nature, part of the interdependent web of life? If you feel that, raise your hand. Okay, so that's pretty much everybody here. So who here understands why having that in law is such a game changer? Okay. Not so many hands. So in this talk, I'm going to explain how our current structure of law exacerbates the problem, how it legitimizes the destruction of nature, and how it prevents ordinary people like you and I from taking action on environmental issues using the law. I'm also going to explain how rights of nature is such a game changer, and say a little bit about how people, ordinary people like you and I, are taking action to bring in a new structure of law to create the kind of world that we want to create for ourselves and also for future generations. So the first thing about law is that our legal system is based on outdated paradigms. This morning, we heard a lot about the outdated paradigms in agriculture and food systems. Well, it's the same in law. Our laws are based on a paradigm that is mechanistic, treats things in isolation from each other, it's anthropocentric. It regards the world as only consisting of human beings and nothing else. It's retributive. It pits one party against the other and is focused on blame and punishment rather than co-creating solutions that get to the root of the problem. Science has long seen a fluid and interconnected world, but our systems really need to catch up. And this is especially the case with the law. In our modern world, law facilitates economics. And the problem is that it's facilitating an economic paradigm, a model of growth that is coupled with the destruction of nature. And the logical conclusion of that is that we end up killing everything. This economic paradigm has one key concept that underlies it, and that is the utility value of nature, valuing nature solely for its usefulness to human beings as a resource for human consumption. Now, this translates in law as nature being an object under the law, separate to us. It's either property or it's fair game. And this has a number of practical drawbacks that make it virtually impossible for ordinary people like you and I to protect nature using the law. The first of this is that we end up with a piecemeal protection system. So nature is an object. The law governs relationships, but it only governs relationships between subjects of the law. And at the moment, the only subjects are human beings and corporations. If there's no relationship, then there's no duty of care. Now, the duty of care is a whole body of law that deals with obligations. So because there's no relationship, no duty of care can exist, because there's no person to owe this duty of care towards, and so there are no obligations towards nature, including no obligations to restore nature or to make good any damage caused to nature. So we start out with a premise that nature is unprotected, and environmental law comes in to carve out protections, and it does this usually around 
endangered species, protection for endangered species and their habitats. However, that system is piecemeal. In an interconnected ecosystem, who's to say which species is a VIP? Also, these laws are fundamentally flawed because they cannot keep pace with current extinction rates. All of these species that are about to go extinct are listed in an annex at the back of the law. And it takes years of scientific research to update these annexes. Scientists are saying that we are losing something like 12 species a day. So in the time that it takes to do the studies to update the annexes, it is already too late. Another drawback of nature being property under the law is that we're stuck in the planning system. All environmental issues are deemed to be planning issues. And the only conversation that can happen in court is whether the correct planning procedure was followed. So communities have to find technical arguments. And that's assuming that they even have standing to bring a case. Even if a technical argument to say that the planners haven't ticked the right boxes was found, the very highest outcome that can come out of the planning tribunal is that it goes back to the planners for them to tick the box. And usually it goes around the cycle and development eventually get, goes ahead, communities run out of steam. The other issue is standing. In the planning system, only people whose property rights have been affected have standing to bring a case. So, for example, me living in the highlands of Scotland, if I'm worried about mining going on in a protected area, I don't have standing to do anything about it because my individual property rights are not affected. And there is also a presumption that all development is beneficial. Economic interests trump everything else. And so this mining in the National Park, which was recently approved in the UK, the, the largest mine inside a national park, was done on economic grounds. Even though there were 29 environmental organizations opposing it with grave concerns about the ecosystem, the law was on the side of the planners, and so it got approved. The only other avenue left in law is litigation. So after a disaster happens, so say for example 10 years down the line and we find that mining inside the national park was not a great idea for the ecosystem. So then if somebody wants to bring a case, they've got to be a property owner inside the national park whose property has been damaged. And then they can bring a case for their own monetary loss. But there's no obligation to restore the damage to nature, because nature is an object under the law, and there's no relationship. So other avenues that have emerged recently, which strengthen the reductionist approach and this nature as property paradigm of biodiversity offsetting. So our governments are now proposing that we should speed up the planning process. So environmental assessments are not required if we can have no net loss of ecosystems. So if I want to do fracking or something like that, I can put in my application and say, I'll destroy this ecosystem here and I'll restore another one somewhere else. And because there's no net loss, it's all OK. Well, you and I both know that ecosystems don't work in that way. Everything is radically interconnected. And we also end up with a governance system where environmental issues are only dealt with at the micro level on individual planning cases, with no requirement to look at the cumulative effect of all of these decisions together. So how is all this relevant to permaculture, you may ask? Well. If I've got my permaculture farm going and I'm doing a great job, but I've got a corporation that's decided to do fracking next door, 
It's the same ecosystem. So we end up, collectively, going nowhere if the law is favoring the destruction. So this is why we need fundamental and we need systemic change. And this is what rights of nature brings. So with rights of nature, we're going from utility value to intrinsic value. We're valuing nature in and of itself. And we do that by making nature a subject of the law, like us, like corporations. And we bring nature into the system. If nature is a subject of the law, then it can be the holder of rights. Rights which are enforceable in court by communities like you and I. With rights of nature, it's not just the ecosystems themselves that now have standing, but also people are empowered to defend the rights of those ecosystems in a court of law. So if I'm up in the highlands and I'm worried about the mining that's going on in England, in the national park, I can now bring a case. I can stand for nature by naming nature as the one that is sustaining the damage and the injury. I don't have to prove that my property rights have been disturbed in any way because there is now an injured party and that's the ecosystem itself. So in making nature a subject of the law, we're also creating this relationship and we're creating the duty of care, the body of law that, that brings in obligations. And this includes the obligation to restore, the obligation to make good the damage that we have done to nature. So any cases, if I were to bring a case because of some damage that, a, that the National Park has sustained, any remedy won't go to me personally, it will go to the National Park, to the restoration of the National Park itself because it is a subject of the law. Having nature as a subject of the law also paves the way for ecological governance, a governance system that understands that ecosystems are interconnected living systems. The highest protection that the law gives is in the form of rights. And the final thing that rights of nature does is that it reverses the psychology of separation from nature which I feel is really at the root of the crisis that we have today. So how are people taking action to bring about this change? Well, expansion in rights has always come from the people. So people in Ecuador campaigned for this approach. They got into conversation with the government. And Ecuador became the first country to have the rights of nature enshrined in law in its constitution. It put it in its constitution, but it didn't translate it into law. In Bolivia, they took that step and they have it in law together with a framework that also deals with transitioning into an economic paradigm that operates in harmony with nature. We see judges, we see lawyers in the court system recognizing the rights of nature in their court judgments in Ecuador, in Belize, in Costa Rica, Argentina, and even New Zealand. Within the UN, there are people who are switching on to these ideas. There is a Harmony with Nature department whose agenda is really to raise awareness within that body for adopting a declaration for the rights of nature. But I'm really interested in the local level. In the United States, in over 36 municipalities, Ordinary people like you and I have gotten into strong conversation with their, with their local leaders and they've brought in legal recognition of rights of nature at the local level. This includes cities like Santa Monica and Pittsburgh and the same happened in Mexico City. Ordinary people like you and me campaigning brought about changes in the law so Mexico City also has rights of nature enshrined in law at local level. I'm holding here 
the Santa Monica Law. And it's really worth a read because it's really quite inspiring. Um, the title is An Ordinance of the City Council of the City of Santa Monica Establishing Sustainability Rights. And in this, they start off explaining pretty much similar to what I've explained to you, that despite having all of these laws, destruction still continues. And having assessed the reason why we think nature being property is a big contributor to this, and we're looking at forward-thinking, progressive countries around the world, like Ecuador, like Bolivia, and taking all that into account, we're now passing this local law. And in the law section, they couple rights of nature with the human right to a healthy environment, recognizing that it's not possible for us human beings to have a right to a healthy environment if the ecosystems that are actually creating the healthy environment don't have a corresponding right to their own integral health. So here we've got the rights of people to clean water from sustainable sources, to clean air, to sustainable food systems, local healthy food, sustainable climate, and all of that. And then we have the rights of natural communities and ecosystems to exist and to flourish. And then we're also, in, in this, giving rights to the residents of the city to be able to protect the rights of nature by bringing cases. So it actually acts to give them standing in courts, which people don't have at the moment. And then the final limb is the subordination of corporate powers when the corporations are acting against the common good. And this, this one's really quite inspiring. It says, all the residents of Santa Monica possess the right to self-governance and to a municipal government which recognizes that all power is inherent in the people, that all free governments are founded on the people's authority and consent, and that corporate entities and their directors and managers do not enjoy special privileges or powers under the law that subordinate the community's rights to their private interests. And that's really tackling it at the core. I find this law very inspiring because it's a live example of something that's done in a local city that was brought in by people, and it's embedded in the planning policy. And it wasn't done in response to a threat. It was done out of the desire to create the world that we all want to create. And we can do the same in Europe. So in Europe, we're bringing a European citizens initiative we have participatory democracy here in Europe, so citizens can propose laws. One million signatures across seven EU states, with a minimum level of 0.01% of the population of those states, can put the rights of nature onto the legislative agenda of the EU. And we've started organizing this. But a citizen's initiative needs people. It needs citizens, and it needs people to take action. And that means you, and that means all your friends. We've drafted a directive. A directive is a very efficient way of bringing change in the EU. Because if the EU adopts a directive, it immediately becomes law in all of the member states. In our directive, we advocate the collective rights of ecosystems and species to exist, thrive, renew their vital cycles, we give legal personality, deal with the duty of care, the human right to the healthy environment, present and future generations, restorative justice, problem-solving courts, ecological governance, and so forth. But that's not the end of it. There are also national initiatives and local initiatives. In Europe, about 18 countries have national initiatives where citizens can propose laws and bring it to referendum. At the local level, several countries in Europe also have that. In the UK, if there's anybody here from the UK, did you know that in the UK, in a parish council, residents can bring any matter to referendum, and it only takes five people plus 10 people present at the meeting to actually propose the referendum. Now, is that not doable? So really, what I'm asking you for is a call to action. Rights cannot be expanded without people coming forward and without expanding our consciousness as well. With every expansion of rights, there came an expansion in consciousness. 
Are we ready to take it to the next level? So I'm inviting you to join us, to get in touch with us. If you feel inspired and you'd like to shift the paradigm of law, you don't know how to draft a law, get in touch with us. If you want to know what the process is to bring a national initiative in your country, get in touch with us. We are here to help. Thank you. So we can take five or uh, seven minutes to, to, uh, to clear up any points that you haven't got from it. I think this was wonderful, really clear, and beautifully brought. And so I would suggest anyone who needs some clarification, uh, one or two sentence question, please. Thank, thanks a lot. It was really, really, really interesting. Um, my dad was a personal injury lawyer, so using phrases like make good damages and things, things I've heard at home, it's really interesting to hear in this context. Um, I was just wondering, is there a universal definition of nature that you've come up with that will apply across campaigns? Because obviously that's mm -hmm. going to be a point of contention throughout. Absolutely. Um, the way we've defined it in our draft directive is um, including but not limited to ecosystem species and the atmospheric climate. Um, however, we've also um, put in there that the um, European Environmental Agency would come up with a universal, a universal definition for what an ecosystem is that can be applied consistently um, throughout all the states. But yeah, when we look at rights of nature laws, um, people are defining the ecosystem or the areas of nature that are protected um, according to what's there in the locality, particularly in the local laws. But one of the general threads is that the focus is on the balance, and so it's mainly ecosystems and species that, that are, yeah, the target of this law. Thank you for a very clear and inspiring talk. Um, one thing that did occur to me was that it's, not, it's in the nature of natural systems that it's not necessarily possible to make good damage done to them. Mm -hmm. So... What would you say about that? In the case that the damage is irreparable, within the law, there are other ways of dealing um, with the person that they've done something, and it may not be possible to restore that ecosystem, but that they ought to do something for nature somewhere. Um, yeah, I agree. Only nature can put itself back and us as human beings can do what we can to help that process along. But in some cases where that isn't possible, we still need to deal with the, the people who've actually done the damage and, um, and kind of get them to behave in ways that can actually enhance nature, albeit somewhere else. Thanks. Um, very good work. Uh, been involved in uh, setting up a, an organisation called Safe Alliance, which is looking at legal tools to counter fracking. We've got a current uh, challenge to raise money to take the government to court. But through that work, one of the things I've seen is that there is no meaningful legal basis for sustainable development. So it's not only has it become a completely meaningless term, it's actually come in a legal way through policy and, and the evolution of law to actually mean just continued economic development. So I wondered if you could comment on whether would, there would be any point in pursuing establishing a proper legal mm. basis to sustainable development, which would include the rights of nature along with the precautionary principle and other key elements. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really key thing that you've, that you've pointed out. With nature being an object under the law, um, what we have is um, what we have is is a system um, where we're always reactively legislating to carve out the protections, and we can't do it fast enough at the moment. So, with rights of nature, we're advocating that we proactively create exactly what you're talking about. Um, actually, create a framework for sustainability 
because like you rightly point out, there isn't one at the moment. So yeah, I'm 100% with you. And that's what we're trying to establish with, um, with our rights of nature. It isn't just about rights, it involves ecological governance, it involves you know, so many other aspects, the human right to the healthy environment, and you know, there, there are so future generations, they're all interlinked. Um, and they all form a comprehensive framework. So, yeah, I would be very interested to connect with you on this. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, uh, nothing. Adios.